Good evening, everyone. Tonight's mission is watching and talking all about Mission Impossible 7. Are we ready to do it, folks? If you decide to take on this mission, you could be put at great peril. And if you decide to take it, we will take no responsibility if you're captured or if anyone is deceased from this review. Okay, that's enough of going that because we are going to self-destruct if we keep on going that way. <laughs> So I don't, and you know, most people shut off our podcast anyway after 30 seconds, so it's okay. <laughs> Welcome to Earth Station One, my friends. It's really good to see everybody tonight, and we got a great one for you. We are talking all about the new Mission Impossible film, and we will be spoiling it. And if you haven't seen it yet, please, folks, go see this film. It was a lot of fun, and we're going to have a pretty good discussion on this one. And so spoilers galore going up, so... You know, so your heads don't explode if we talk about a certain thing and go, oh, my God, I didn't know that. And, you know, like that this was a part one of two, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it already was a frippin' long movie. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if my bladder can handle another three hours of Tom Cruise. So it'll be real interesting to see what happens with that. But we got a great crew to talk all about this film tonight, folks. Of course, joining us is Ms. Ashley Pauls. Welcome. Thank you. I've missed um, being apart the last couple of weeks, so it's nice to be back and talking movies with the crew. Oh, definitely. But we've got a few movies coming up, actually, that you'll be part of. So it'll yes. be very cool to have you back and everything. And joining us for the very, very first time, let's welcome Jenny Green. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited. It is great. And it's great. You are. We got you through the American sci-fi track. And it's yeah. a, very cool to have you through Dragon Con. So have you been going to Dragon Con long or? Yeah, I mean, I want to say probably close to 10 years now. So okay. it's oh, been a she's while. A Riley veteran. Yeah. Ashley, you need to pick up your game, huh? You know, I you... know. Yeah. <laughs> Only one Dragon Con. Like, it's just not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, at least we don't have to call you newbie Ashley anymore. So That's right. I have been to one and so. it was amazing. So, so highly uh, recommend. It is awesome. And she didn't self-destruct folks, so it's pretty cool. So it's, I'm still I'm still here. Exactly. And she's actually talking. And then are you sure you really did Dragon Con? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it actually Ashley or is it AI generated Ashley? Who oh can no, say? no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> We might have to go on strike against that one. I don't know about that. So definitely very cool to have you both here. And of course, Mr. Mike Gordon is with us. Howdy. He is the taskmaster of Earth Station One, so it is going to be very interesting to see where he goes with this one tonight, folks. Mr. Mike, you ready to talk about this wonderful movie? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get involved. Uh, it's um, We like to start with the box office, of course, and uh, just as usual, I think this year, it's a, it's the same old, it's a very tired song by this point, but guess what? Mission Impossible underperformed <laughs> just like almost uh, sure. everything else this year i know shocked right shocked uh but uh they it did about um 80 million uh in the uh, united states and canada uh the first weekend uh and that now that means um it opened earlier so it had a few more days to to uh, account for that but still they wanted more uh especially after the huge success of uh top gun maverick last year i think expectations were very very high although really um this is pretty much on par with most of the mission impossible movies uh most of the mission impossible movies open around 60 50 million dollars that opening weekend and and you know if you take out the you know the two extra days that's pretty much on par for what this one did now, I think a lot of people were expecting more because of Maverick, um, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, so I think they consider this a uh, underperforming. Um, I know, Ashley, we talked about it um, at the beginning when we did our predictions, and we did think that there was going to be a bump from Maverick. Uh, are you surprised that it's not here? You know, I actually am a little surprised that this wasn't higher, especially since you it got very good critical reviews and is getting pretty good audience buzz. So I was really surprised to see that it didn't go higher at the box office. And I think this is 
like you said, another symptom of people's box office and movie going habits changing because some of the other movies that underperformed didn't do so as well with critics and maybe had some more mixed buzz, but this one had very positive bug uh, buzz and quote unquote, like really big name recognizable stars. So I think, yeah, I think this is something that Hollywood needs to take note of. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think at this point, lots of films are underperforming. Some of them deserve to, some of them maybe didn't, but it's just kind of the reality of the box office right now, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, you uh, recently had a article on the ESO Network website that said that not only are they underperforming bo- box office wise, but it seems like a lot of these movies this year are underperforming just in your sort of feelings about them as well. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. And just people, it feels like it's been a while since we've had something that people are like super excited about, oh, like that all movie that we universally love, like when we were all so thrilled about Avengers Endgame and really excited about it. So yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what's going on. I think there's a lot changing, especially with some of the writers and actor strikes will impact this too. So it's, we're sailing into some choppy waters i think is is fair to say but um yeah i it will be interesting to see how everything plays out that's Penny, do you do, do you pay stuff. attention to the box office at all is this something that yeah. uh, you're concerned about at all i mean i do and this one um did surprise me i think i was surprised that it underperformed um but for me i think it's i have i feel like i think that a lot of it has to do with people just being willing to wait for streaming mm-hmm. now at this point, people are like, I don't want to even that to... long. Right. I yeah. Mean... <laughs> right. But what I think will be interesting about this movie is will the box office pick up a little bit? Because I think we saw with Maverick that Tom and Chris McQuarrie, they're not interested in rushing these movies to digital. I mean, obviously I do think if it's underperforming, that might push it a little bit, but I'm waiting to see you know, what what's in in the contract? What has Tom negotiated, et cetera, to keep this in the theaters longer? And will we see a bump sort of on the back end with this? Yeah, good point. Good point. Because, yeah, I mean, it's been a really competitive summer. Um, and this weekend coming up, we have Barbageddon. Or, or Bob and Harmon, sorry. <laughs> Bob and Harmon, <laughs> right? It so, is Barbageddon, so, but that's a whole uh, story. I know, right? That's a whole different thing. Uh, Bob and Heimer is coming up this weekend. Uh, so... So Tom's going to lose some of those premium screens for sure. sure. Now, uh, two weeks, does he get them back? Um, you know, that's going to be a really interesting uh, question as well. Um, uh, Mike, what do you what do you think? What do you make of uh, the box office in general, in particular, uh, with this one movie? I th- really think, truth and in all honesty, I think since COVID, the whole movie industry has changed. People going to the theaters, people... You know, a lot of people, more people are waiting for it to come home and being able to watch this in the comfort of their own home and a movie like this. And this movie has been getting a lot of good word of mouth. This has been getting, you know, people coming out and saying this has been great. And on social media, the critics love this movie. This is on. I don't really go by Rotten Tomatoes, but Rotten Tomatoes, this is a 98 percent. Yeah, the cinema score in this one is pretty high. And the fans is 96. That's pretty amazing for this. And then to see it underperform, it's just that people are not going out to the theaters as much. And also, the weather has changed so much in all across the United States that you're getting extreme heat. And especially in the Northeast, you're getting very extreme wet rains and stuff and it's keeping people in the house and also people getting flooded they're not going to go to the movies then and everything it's just it's just interesting to you know to think about that and that's another thing you have to take into account i think this w- movie is not going to go away from the theaters for quite some time i think it's you know after literally after barbageddon it's you know as you like to put it it's you know literally I don't think Haunted Mansion is going to do any gangbusters. And truthfully, I'm looking forward to seeing Blue Beetle, but I don't think it. I think this movie is going to be possibly, you know, in two or three weeks, it's going to be popping up its head as number one again. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it is possible. I mean, sure. Uh, you know, August is usually the the slower month. Mm -hmm. um, and as you pointed out, you know, outside of uh, the two movies we've got coming out this uh, this weekend, you know, there it's few and far between. So, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this tracks, because mm -hmm. right now the only real success I think you can say for this summer has been really uh, across the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. um, Guardians did pretty well. And I think right now that's still the number one movie of the summer, although Across the Spider-Verse is gaining on it really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I Guardians, think it's going to overtake it, it as just well. just announced today, Guardians is coming to Disney Plus August 2nd. Sure. Wow. So, so it, yeah, it'll, yeah. So it's pretty much done what it can is going to do in theaters, I think. Um, neither one of which I think, uh, are going to surpass nothing. I don't think is going to surpass, uh, Super Mario Brothers, which opened before the summer and is right now the number one movie of the year. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting, but, but I, 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 this was a big test because due to Tom's success last year, some say unexpected, huge success last year. I think a lot of expectations were put on this one as far as it was going to get a huge bump, but it, I don't. I don't think it did. Now, like I said, it's on par with almost all the other Mission Impossible movies. So, but in truth, Mike, and you know, it's a different breed of movie than going between Top Gun and Mission Impossible. People went to go see Top Gun because America, you know, type thing, and mm -hmm. you know, you know, the patriotic and the nostalgia and such. This is a continuation in a very long series, mm -hmm. and it's overperforming the previous their predecessors but it also at the same time is you know suffering from a summer where people are just not going to the films yeah it's also one of the few like there were two i think that uh movies in particular one of which was across the spider-verse that uh did leave a bad taste in people's mouth because they were part ones but they were not advertised as such mm -hmm. this one right from the get-go was advertised as part one so you knew going in that it was not going to be completely resolved um and whether or not that kept people away as well i, I don't mm -hmm. know at this point like it's just there's so many different factors i think as you pointed out uh specifically jenny that 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 it's going to be interesting to see how this rides out before mm -hmm. we can really tell uh the final tale on this one but that's for the box office as far as our our personal opinions uh jenny i'm, I'm kind of curious now i can see from the the your your uh background that uh you you have a little bit of tom cruise uh fandom <laughs> in you um so uh what is your history with this franchise and what were your expectations going into this one so i thought it was actually a casual um mission impossible fan um i am weirdly not really a tom cruise fan which this makes people think otherwise um <laughs> i'm just a top gun fan like very mm. hardcore top gun fan um so i still had really high hopes though kind of seeing with the cast list who they were bringing in um I will say, though, the one thing I did not expect was to laugh the entire time, almost. And that just added a layer to it that I was like, wow, like I enjoyed this way more than I even expected because I just, you know, you expected thriller. I Everyone I had talked to was like, it goes, it goes for three hours. You're never going to sit down. Your heart rate's going to be up the, up the entire time. And then I laughed for three hours and I was like, this is the best. <laughs> that is an interesting take on it. I don't know if that was intentional. <laughs> I, I feel like there were a lot of like funny moments woven into it. Like it was I, meant yes, to I do be believe funny. So, yeah. But I think you also had to have the sense of humor to laugh at it. It, it wasn't universal per se, but if you had that sense of humor, they knew you were going to laugh about it. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. There's the, the, these are not to be taken. I don't think terribly seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are, these are fun movies uh, I, overall, I think uh, even if the participants or the characters are pretty intense and taking them things way too seriously, 
I think we're as an audience not really meant to do that as well. Um, part of the fun because you know they were taking themselves too seriously at parts, and that was the funny parts about it. You're like, oh, come on, lighten up, you know. <laughs> uh, that the fate of the world is at stake, Mike. <laughs> uh, how can you how can you laugh at a time like this? Uh, Ashley, what were your thoughts going into this one? Yeah, so I kind of jumped into the Mission Impossible franchise, um, not at the beginning, but when Ghost Protocol came out. I remember um, our IMAX theater in town was kind of new, so I had heard lots of good reviews about the movie, so I thought, I'm going to go see this. It is, to this day, the first time I have ever screamed in a theater was when he's climbing up the extremely tall building and the suction cups separate I, I verbally screamed in the theater, so sorry to everybody who was in that showing with me, but um, I've been a fan ever since. And really, it seems weird that a franchise like this has gone seven movies, the la- later half of them seem to be consistently entertaining. Like, I have always go in, and I had a good time, and I, you know, I had an absolute blast with this movie. It, like you mentioned, Jenny, there's there was some funny moments that kind of, like, helped break the tension there were some incredible action sequences like that scene on the train where the cars are just like slowly falling off the cliff. And then the fact that Tom Cruise is ridiculous and drove a motorcycle actually off a cliff and parachuted. Um, I think just an appreciation for old school Hollywood type stunts. This was just a such a fun action movie. I really loved it. I appreciated that they were honest that this was part one and they thought they gave us enough of an ending, but also made us want to come back for more. I thought Haley Atwell was absolutely delightful. I loved her character and getting her to play a slightly more shady um, type of secret agent than the wonderful, but always above board Peggy Carter. So um, I just had so much fun with this one. And I do hope that word of mouth motivates some more people to get out and see this because this really is like the perfect summer blockbuster. There's action, there's some, uh, there's excitement and it's just, it's just a fun film. Yeah. I, I, to your point, I do think um, a lot of the appeal of these movies is not so much the cast is not so much the plot is not so much what's going on. It's what dumb thing is Tom Cruise going to do now? Like, right, it's just yeah, like, like, yeah. cause we know he's not, I mean, we know he does these things. He's done it's. I mean, yeah, there's uh some CG involved. Sure. But for the most part, when, when he's out there uh, doing like what looks like death defying things, Mm, there's uh, some maybe death defying going on, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I was joking with my dad as we were walking into the theater to see it. It's like, I wonder how much it costs to insure Tom Cruise on one of these movies. Can he even be <laughs> insured or does he have yeah. to sign some waiver that says, like, I I release from responsibility the film company or whatever. I'm just going to do stunts, whatever I want to do. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a good I question. I would to see the insurance policy I mean, for that. Yeah, no. that's why they... That's why the budgets are so high. At this yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, what about you? What did, how did you feel about uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1? I enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. I literally got home 20 minutes before we were recorded to go see this movie. And you still got that Dead Reckoning afterglow. Oh, I do. I have that Tom Cruise grow on me, you know, and it's like, it's interesting, though, because it was fun. It was a popcorn movie. It was everything you wanted. Stunts, you know, some of the stunts, you know, we've seen before, but that motorcycle jump, wow, that was just awesome. And the chemistry between the veterans of this movie, you know, Ving Rhames, um, and then also, of course, you know, you, well, of course, Simon is just awesome in everything he does. And then Tom... The three of them, you know, I could see them just do a movie, just them sitting around a room arguing with each other would just be awesome. And I like the supporting cast around it. And I like how they hearkened back all the way to the early movies in this one with some of the characters. And it was just really, really well done. I was not a big fan of Mission Impossible 1 through 3. And that's, I thought it started gelling for num- with number four on. And I think, Ashley, you said something similar. And so it was, it was, it was fun because 
this harkens to a true, you know, espionage. This guy is almost like, you know, everyone's out to get him. It almost, you know, there's things if actually they were trying, it felt like they were trying to grab from John Wick or something like that. I felt a couple of times, especially like that driving scene when they were in Rome, you know, and going through the alleyways and stuff. It felt very similar to the last John Wick movie that had in the Arc of Triumph the in Paris and everything, the car scenes there. And so it, it was fun. It was good. And I never want to trust, you know, Haley Atwell with a uh, car ever. You know, she is not a good driver. She is so not a good driver. But it was it was it was fun to see. Uh loved a lot of the supporting cast, and we'll get into that in a few, because there were some characters I think stole this. And I thought they were really, really cool. And I want to see more of these actors and such and other things. So it was pretty cool. My uh history with the franchise, I guess uh I mean we've talked about it before, but just real briefly, um I love the original series that the these movies are based on. Uh I love the Mission Impossible series a lot actually. And uh my biggest disappointment with the movies is that they are not really the the series that they're based on. I mean there's elements to be sure, but um it, everything I liked about the series is not quite uh, been brought to life in the movies per se. However, um, I, w- I do agree that the first one uh, I, I was disappointed with. The second one, is, I just think, is terrible. Uh, the third one is when it sort of picked up for me. That's when uh, uh, Abrams directs. Uh, that's when Simon Pegg's character comes in. Hard to believe that two of the other characters, uh, Ving Rhames and... Uh, Oh man, the guy that plays his handler, um, uh, Hunt's handler, has been through the franchise for the entire time, um, and that's uh, that's uh, to their credit, really. Um, but yeah, Simon Pegg joins in in the third one, and I think that's when things really start to connect as a team. It's not just like one man doing things; it's a team based uh, show or team based movie, and that's when it. And, and some of them have been better than others. I've seen some of them in the theater. Some of them I've waited for. I've never given up on the franchise, but to be honest with you, when I try to think about the past six that have gone on before then, it's all a muddled mess. I just, I don't know which ones are which. I don't remember which characters are there or not. Like some of them just seem to be cookie cutter and interchangeable, et cetera, et cetera. So um, my thoughts to go in then this one is that, well, you know, it's, it's Tom doing something incredible, of course. Um, And we got the, the, uh, the bike going over the cliff we knew that was going to happen from all the trailers that we've seen and unfortunately i've seen that trailer before every single movie i've seen this year <laughs> and so yeah, and every time on the big you know, and on the, i know right and every time on the big screen I, I, my acrophobia kicks in and i'm like eek um uh so when it's finally unveiled here in the movie it was a little anticlimactic for me, to be honest with you. Now, that's not the movie's fault because it, it was surely going to promote that and everything like that. But I did think that it was very, very contrived to get us to there. Like, it just seemed like it, like it made absolutely no sense to get us there. But I will say that the train sequence was phenomenal. Um, as you pointed out, Mike, we had sort of a similar sequence in Indiana Jones with the train. Uh, also with John Wick, you know, with the... Uh, with the uh, roundabout, we had that sort of experience as well. I think Mission Impossible does those sequences better. Um, and I think it is overall, the action sequences are pretty pretty top-notch. Uh, the plot is there. It's, it's kind of just there. Um, there's a lot of characters that they bring in from the past, some of which I kind of remembered and some of which I didn't know if I was supposed to remember, if they actually were there or not. I... I I know that we were talking about spoilers. I had no idea that Ethan Hunt was like a criminal before this. For some reason, I didn't. I don't know if that was ever really expressed. It's been a while since I've seen the first one or whatever. So I don't know if that's all true or not. But in any case, I will say that the production of it is great. The uh, The actors are great. I do like the addition of not only Halle Atwell from the MCU, uh, notably from the MCU, of course, but also... Um, Tom, uh, I'm going to mispronounce her last name for sure. Uh, help me out, somebody. Nobody's willing to go on record. 
<laughs> she is amazing in this too uh so you've got two character or two actors from the mcu in here uh rebecca ferguson is always amazing so she's welcome in this as well um and you know last but i don't think it's least the music just freaking rocks it's th- it's this is one of the best theme songs of all time and when it's played here which it's played a lot it's always it always gets your your blood boiling it always makes you like gives you goosebumps it always is a thrilling ride because that music is incredible um so i do think the whole package is put together pretty well um i'm not going to say it is is great um but it it's it it does what it needs to do and i think it it makes it you know like i'm there for part two part two is supposed to come out i guess next year um and i'll be there because i'm i'm curious enough it's it's a it's a enough of an investment that i think it's worth it um but uh did it did it really blow me away as the best of the franchise or whatever Mm, i can't say that i can't say that it did it's just another mission impossible movie for me it's just another mission for him um but that said uh let's talk about more specifics i think mike you wanted to uh hit on maybe some characters uh that uh that you wanted to single out so we'll start with you what uh what uh what do you want to what do you want to single out as uh maybe stealing the show as you put it truthfully you know i think pom stole it for me i thought she was amazing especially the driving scenes in rome i thought you know the look on her face she was just driving that you know military humvee through everything and it was just it was just awesome and i was like watching it and it says that ain't man mantis nope nope uh, she is so much more psychic psycho for it you know so it was pretty cool and it was her character though i didn't see you know the whole thing with her becoming you know betraying gideon and such you know it's like that kind of took me by surprise because it kind of came out of nowhere just because John, because I almost said John Wick didn't kill her, but Ethan Hunt didn't kill her in that fight scene. And that, but she was great. And, you know, every scene she was in, she was eating up the scenery. And that's what you want from, you know, a henchman or a villain. And it, I think I liked her more as a villain than Gideon. And so, and, you know, it was so, it was just, it was real interesting to see. And, I, you know, like I said earlier, you know, I, you know, seeing Ving Rhames, Simon Pegg back and, you know, you even had Rebecca Ferguson back and, you know, so it was neat to see these characters from the other movies. I almost fully expected to see Jeremy, Jeremy Renner pop up somewhere and everything because he's been in these also. So it was cool. Hallie Atwell thought she was great, but she didn't wow me in this and i know some people were wowed by her and i liked her character i thought it was good but it wasn't like oh my god she stole the movie and everything she was good but she wasn't great if the in that and i think that was my actually she was my major disappointment with the movie Hmm. wow jenny what about you any of the characters stand out for you as well um so Palm definitely, um, what she brought to that character without uttering words for a large part of the movie. Um, so that was really, really special. Um, I also really loved the little duo of Jasper and Degas, like a lot. Um, mm-hmm. There was some character development, especially with Degas, that I really, really loved. You know, by the end, he's going, w- w- could he be right? And I was like, I appreciated sort of that 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 glow up <laughs> with that character shall we say um but i i enjoyed that little duo you know you kind of have the team already you have ethan's team then you saw this little sort of accessory team on the other side and i liked the sort of balance between the two mm-hmm. and it was interesting because it seemed like jasper really had it out for hunt yeah and everything it was like no matter what he was just like and then the for him when they were on top of the train and when Ethan gave the gun back, he was like, Oh, maybe I have been wrong. Mm. Yeah. So it was interesting there. Yeah. That's, I, will say, uh, I, I was also disappointed with Haley. Like it was <laughs> not quite what I expected. Um, I wanted a little bit more, but I think it was cause she was overshadowed by Palm and Rebecca. Really? It, it had True. we not had those two strong 
female characters, I think she probably would have shined a little bit even brighter in the movie than she did. And I'm not saying she was bad, but she wasn't the, she wasn't the female I think of when I think of this movie. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I put a line in that too. Um, I mean, there's a lot of competition for um, Ethan's sort of connection, women connections in this, right? Like, uh, um, and, and Haley is meant to be, I think it's a little bit forced. Like it feels like we're, we're forced to to feel a connection between the two of them, even though it really isn't there just yet. Um, it's still developing and it's like, oh, well, you know, Ethan's going to lose you and because he cares about you. And I'm like, he just met her. Like, yeah, I, just, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't he wants her dead, but he just met her. Like, you know, if it came down to him and, and uh, you know, Rebecca Ferguson's character, Isla or whatever, uh, Ilsa, I was like, I was like, I don't, I mean, I hate to make him choose, but I think, you know, he's going to go with the woman he knows more, but yeah. uh, for longer. But anyway, uh, Ashley, what about you? Um, uh, any more thoughts on either Haley or some of the other characters? Yeah, so it's always interesting seeing people's different perspectives because I actually absolutely adored Haley in this movie I thought she was great and she did kind of steal the show for me so it's always kind of interesting to see how different people can react to the same performance but I think it was partly also just kind of the fun seeing her in kind of an espionage spy type movie but playing something different than um Peggy Carter I thought she had like a lot of charm I was curious to learn more about her I think there's layers to her that we will get to see in future movies and something that I just also appreciated was seeing so many great different women characters they were not all the same they had a variety of roles to play and it's fun seeing characters like Vanessa Kirby not a hero definitely but not necessarily a villain like kind of spread out along those shades of gray so um it was really cool to see that broad range. And I, I was kind of surprised that um, Rebecca Ferguson died. I was thinking that Haley was going to be the one that would end up dying because he would pick um, Rebecca. But interesting that she was the one that ended up leaving. So I'm curious to see how this is all developed in the second movie. And Ginny, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned uh, Dega as well, because I thought that he was kind of interesting. Those two American agents, CIA or whatever they are, could have very easily been just like forgettable background characters. But I think they did enough with them that I was kind of interested in like what they're doing, like wanting to make sure they're okay. And hopefully we will see them um, get to play a role in the next one as well. But the thing about uh, a movie like an Mission Impossible movie is, though, you you're pretty sure you can never take any of these characters at their word. Like, yes, everything yes. That you see, everybody that you meet, you're like, is this really uh, this person or are they a double agent, a triple agent? Yes. If I see someone die, did they really die? Are they going to come back later? Like. I mean, they did that with us once earlier in the movie with uh, Rebecca Ferguson's character yeah. where we thought she was dead and then she wasn't. And then, then boom, she's dead again. And it's like, well, am I supposed to believe it this time? Like, it's like sometimes that sort of trope, like, kind of wears yes. on you and you just kind of like go, well, I don't care about anybody because I can't trust anybody. I don't they're not doing enough of the work to mm-hmm. for me to like the to make me care one way or the other and and i kind of feel like that 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 happens in these movies but i mean it still works but i wish it was a little bit done done written a little bit better i think i almost fully expect her in the next movie someone go okay it's really and you yank off the mask and you know like it was all part of the ruse because they've done so many of these complicated fake outs and Mm -hmm. missions that it's entirely possible that they wanted her to them to think she was dead so yeah uh, who who can say till we see part two mm-hmm. yeah I, I do think though i mean my gut tells me that uh grace uh atwell's character is n- there's still something more to her than mm-hmm. than we we've learned so far i i don't know exactly how it's going to play out but i think there's more to her um i, so. I really hope so other than saying that he was overshadowed, we haven't much mentioned Gabriel. 
<laughs> um, good villain, bad villain, meh villain. Uh, what do we think of uh, Gabriel here, uh, Ashley? What did what did you think of the big bad? Yeah, I thought he was fine. He's not necessarily like a standout villain in the way like the famous over the top James Bond villains are. Like you, you know them, you remember them because they are such characters. He's more of kind of a facilitator, a go-between because you need kind of a human face to humanize the villain and it can't just be this like impersonal AI. So I think they needed a physical actor, but I thought the choice of AI was interesting, definitely very timely as something that we're all talking about. And um, Chris, sorry, I have a cat that's trying to in, invade the podcast screen here. So um, there's an earthquake in kansas yeah or a cat but um yeah i thought yeah (laughs) the choice of ai was interesting and very timely something that you know we're all talking about culture like are there is there a dark side to this technology are there benefits and while we're not at the point yet like with the sentient ai i thought it was interesting i'm sure it's something that a lot of intelligence organizations behind closed doors are discussing and talking about yeah, I mean, yeah, we've certainly seen AIs uh, used as as sort of, you know, uh, bad guys before, even in espionage, things like this. Mm-hmm. Um, the entity is an interesting idea. And, and I did think you're right. It's kind of timely, especially like right now where yeah. like like, you know, Tom Cruise and, and everybody are like. <laughs> openly striking against uh right yeah it's AIs, very interesting right? that hollywood um, studios released this movie in the midst of actors saying like hey we have concerns about our likeness just being taken out of our control so and it's interesting that tom uh, that ethan's character i should say ethan hunt's character wants to destroy it um uh, you know i don't know if it's a um you know a a sort of statement that they're making because Look, like I said before, these movies use CG, but they but ultimately a lot of the stunts are done practically mm-hmm. and 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 as real as possible. And I can't help but feel like, you know, Tom equals Ethan in this equation, right? Like Tom's views about AI or Ethan's views about AI are like Tom's views of using CG to do your effects and everything and stunts. So I, I do think that's an interesting parallel. I don't know how intentional it is, but I do think it's interesting. Um uh, Mike, any thoughts about uh, the entity Gabriel and the the, uh, the whole uh, oh, do machinations ever. behind everything that's going do on here? Do I ever? As soon as they announced, you know, started going into, oh, it's a sentient, you know, being, you know, entity, you know, and it was just like, oh, geez, we're doing this again, you know, dudes. We saw this for almost five seasons on a TV show called Person of Interest. And they literally did the same exact story. A good, you know, and the evil, you know, machine and the whole thing with the person who was the voice of it. And of course, the good guys who had the good machine. And it was, it was just, it, it's interesting because I was rolling my eyes at the storyline because we had seen this before. But I like some of the twists that they did, you know, that, you know, that it's trying to gain, you know, sentence on its own and not have it being worked on by the government. And, but, you know, the, it was actually created by the U S and it was being, you know, tested because you thought the Russians were, had created at the beginning of the movie and everything to, you know, for that stealth submarine, that's what the whole opening scene was. And you, because you saw the AI take over the system and everything, and you thought that was all part of it, and but there was just a malfunction of some kind. But then you found out during the process of the movie that it was actually the Americans who actually, you know, put it in. They knew about the submarine and they actually, you know, basically put a bug into it or a virus into the sub. And it was interesting. And it gave it a little more depth and everything. The, the thought of Gabriel, because the actor was fantastic. He was so slimy and so slick, and it was perfect. And, you know, I like how he had the connection to Ethan. 
and you know how Ethan be as Ethan said, he's the one who created what you see in front of me, you now and everything. So it was interesting with that. But other than that, as the mouthpiece for the entity, I was like, eh, and everything. I just I'm almost trying to wonder, you know, where they are gonna go with it and everything. And how are they gonna make it almost more mission impossibly for the second one? <laughs> Part two, uh, which, uh, yeah, which I'm sure will be, you know, another two and a half hours as well. Well, um, they might not of, be, you might not be seeing it for quite some time because it had been almost fully filmed except for the main scene, you know, for the was not filmed yet as of July 7th. And now everybody's on strike. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything's there's going to be delay with everything now. So, um I I do think though we will get a resolution to this movie before we see a resolution to either across the spider verse or what was the other one that had a uh first part uh Fast and Furious uh, uh 10 plus or whatever it's called I don't uh, remember <laughs> I don't know what you were talking about So um uh any any other thoughts on the on the plot or uh, the villainry going on here uh jenny i'm just waiting for gabriel to be totally what not what he seems i i know we were talking you know kind of you, you can't trust anybody and i feel like he's so straightforward as this mouthpiece for the entity that there's something we're missing um mm, about actually, him and it's right in front of us too Right. I, I, and I don't know why we can't see it, but I, there's something that I feel like we're missing about him. I then I am your father. <laughs> he just doesn't, I don't want to be like, he doesn't feel villainy, villainy enough to me, but I don't, I, I know, I know it just, there was, and I don't mean this like that he didn't play a good bad guy. He play, it was a great bad guy, but it just felt like there was some sort of twist that's going to turn him back to me that feels like it's not what we think it is. So, Oh, the yeah. scene where he killed the, uh, the locomotive engineers yeah, and the you bad know, guy. Oh, bad guy, <laughs> big time. And he, was, he, he hung one of the engineers and he was pulling on it to, to do the, the horn. Of the, the it's a, he's a bad man. And, so, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I think uh, Morales does a great job of playing him, but I think to Jenny's point, you're right because the one thing that's missing is we have no idea what he why why he does what he does. I mean, he's pretty much just he might as well just be like a a, a tool of the entity. I mean, he is a tool of the he entity, but I mean, he's he feels like he's got no personality of, of his own. Yeah. Um, and and what does that mean? Um, so yeah, I do feel like that's. Uh, that's a that's a drawback and maybe it's supposed to be intriguing for part two you just don't know whether or not you know they're leaving a lot of these things on the table for part two or if they just dropped the ball on a few things uh i will say mike that your mention of purse of interest which as a show as you know i love so much um it man like if nolan and joy were in charge of this movie it would be so incredible uh i mean to have like a a movie where you have an entity creating like like you know human bots or whatever that are that are not distinguished from from humans in addition to ethan and his crew like being like all like um not being able like using their masks and everything like that it's like this it could cause like really like a lot of chaos and a very good story and intriguingly depth story but we're not getting that here um (laughs) so but it is what it is i mean i you know tom keeps it simple uh i mean i think that's one thing you can say about most of his movies that you know that he's in charge of he keeps it simple and delivers what he wants to do which is a good time at the movies um anything else about this movie in particular before we kind of speculate maybe on on the future of the franchise in the second movie um ashley do you have any other notes about the movie that uh you wanted to bring to our attention either good or bad yeah, no, I think we've done a good job kind of covering it and um, hitting the highlights. I was glad at the beginning you also mentioned the music because I felt like the music was maybe like even kicked up a notch from the past franchises. Really liked that and really carried the movie along. 
Um, in terms of its runtime, like I was not bored ever during this movie. Like I felt like I kept waiting for a good time to get up and go to the bathroom. And then the movie was over because like it pretty much just goes straight. But I feel like we've been tending towards slightly longer movies in Hollywood. And I would really like to see more kind of hit more between closer to that two hour and two and a half hour kind of being the max. So I, I don't know what I would have trimmed, but um as as much as I love a good epic blockbuster, not every movie needs to be close to three hours, especially when you got to get up and go to work the next day. So that that's um, something that I maybe would have changed is trimmed it down just just a hair. I will uh you know, I mean it is you're right. It's something that we've mentioned, I think, for the last year or so that movies that are under two hours are very rare. Um, I will say that uh Margot and Company have uh, and Greta have taken taken a hint and uh Barbie is just shy of two hours. So uh, you know, so it is it's just about two hours long. Um, but of course, you know, if you plan to do the uh Barbenheim double feature, you're gonna be at the theater all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chris, Christopher <laughs> Nolan love him, but he he did he three hours. He's just going all the way. Uh, Jenny, th- Jenny, anything else about the movie that uh, you wanted to point out, good or bad? No, not necessarily. I think definitely, you know, we definitely hit most of the things that I had been thinking about. Just overall, I think you know when we said it, I just really enjoyed the ensemble. I think the ensemble as a whole. Even if you had some people who you expected more from or you had the people who you got more from, the ensemble as a whole worked really well. And um, when you have that many characters, I think that that's important. And so it was a big plus for me. I will say that uh, I thought Benji was a dead man in this movie. I figured I something had told me that Benji was not going to make it out of this movie. And actually, you know, the airport. what do you mean? Well, the airport was a scare uh, for sure. Uh, and that was a that was a, you know, kind of a false scare. But then I thought, you know, wouldn't have been an interesting twist if, you know, Gabriel, who went to kill either uh, of the women there, if Benji had gotten there first and and got killed and the other two women had survived. I'm like, that would have been an interesting twist that I probably would have been surprised by. And I would have given this movie a lot of credit for, even though I love Ethan. Um, uh, Simon Pegg a lot and uh, would hate to see him go. But um, anyway, any other thoughts on on this movie itself from, from you, Mike? Yeah. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is the cinematography in this film. Mm-hmm. This film was gorgeous from the, the shots in the desert to the airport shots. And then, of course, in Rome and Venice was just awesome. And then in the mountains with that train scene was beautiful. It was some really really amazing shots and i you know the cinematography alone would be worth seeing it up on the big screen but then seeing the stunts also on the big screen is just like all right this is awesome you know type thing yeah good point yes absolutely yeah these movies are made really well um uh editing wise cinematography wise directing wise i mean they're they're they're, they're professionals at work here you could definitely tell Mm -hmm. um it's it's very smooth um, and, and like, yeah, the, the scenes, um, and they convey what they're supposed to convey in terms of action. Um, the, uh, the jump, even though I'd seen it a several times, my acrophobia still kicks in when, when they go over the cliff, um, and the train sequences, I mean, I can't, you know, uh, the action sequences seem like there's legitimate, like that those trains are moving and there's people on those trains. Uh, and, uh, it, Practical effects has a feel that it cannot be replicated yet uh, to any sort of satisfaction as far as uh, CG goes. I mean, it's just it does matter, even though the actors, you know, are like, we don't want to get on top of the train. But Tom's making us do this like they're like, (laughs) I mean, when you sign on for a Mission Impossible movie for a Tom Cruise movie, you know, you're going to have to do some things Uh, you just know. So. You know, that's the price you pay for working with Tom and being in a, you know, huge movie like this. Um, All right. So, like I said, Dead Reckoning Part 2 is scheduled to come out next summer. Um, As we all know, it could be delayed uh, for a variety of reasons. But um, what do we want to see? Now, this is supposed to be or was at least touted originally to be Ethan Hunt's last mission. 
Uh, do we feel like it's Ethan Hunt's last mission or uh, do we feel like there's more in the tank for Tom? Ueah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jenny, you're shaking your head. You're saying that there's more in the tank, or you don't buy oh, this? Oh no, there definitely time. is. I mean, Tom's already talking. I want to be Harrison Ford. Like, I want to. I don't know if anyone <laughs> saw that interview though. Oh he was, yeah. You know, he's like Harrison. Is you know, is still doing indie. I can do that. And I don't know. You know, I don't want to be like superficial, but the man keeps himself in good shape. He clearly enjoys doing these kind of movies. Um, I think I think that he hit a real stride with Christopher McQuarrie with the, with this mm -hmm. franchise now, yeah, I and I that. think you're you're we're just going to see more from them, even if you know some of these newcomers, these more supporting characters in this movie take bigger roles moving forward. I de I definitely I think there's more in the tank. Yeah, it always surprises me that there's only like you know three people in the INF. Like that's like I mean I mean granted I mean. Because especially when the delivery guy at the beginning is like, okay, welcome to the INF. And I'm like going, uh, there's more people than three. Um, I mean, but not, a, I don't know. It just seems like it's a small team. Now, granted, they keep dying. I get that. But they don't seem to be replacing them too often. Although, who knows? I mean, it looks like, you know, they could be opening up the door for um, one of the CIA guys, uh, as you guys mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, that could be a door open for one, if not both of them that joining. I mean, well. we don't know why Jasper mm -hmm. has a mad on for Hunt, but maybe it's because he was supposed to be in the IMF. Oh, a little jealous. There was one <laughs> spot, too. <Okay. laughs> exactly. No, no double O eights allowed, right? Uh, Ashley, what about you? Do you think this is the last ride for Tom or do you want do you want to see more? You know what? If they continue to be entertaining, like I'll be here to see more. Um I have a feeling like box office will probably play a role. Like if the second one tanks, then it may be a rest before we see more. But I, I mean, as long as these movies continue to be fun and entertaining, I'm on board. I'm looking forward to seeing how they wrap it up and what um, outrageous stunt they will come up with. I can't think of anything off the top of my head to top what they've done previously, but I'm sure they will think of something. So, yeah, yeah um, I think as long as they continue to be entertaining, I would like to see more. But also, yeah, I'd like to see some of the newer characters become recurring characters and continue to play a little bit more of a role and dig into them a little bit deeper. Is this well. a franchise that can exist without Tom? You know what? I feel like if he's done, I feel like they would have to retire it for a little bit before rebooting it. I feel like you would need someone with that same level of commitment or energy, like love him or hate him as a person. Like he never phones it in. He goes like he's bringing his a game. So I feel like if you are going to reboot it, you need somebody that's going to bring that insane level of energy and dedication to it. And I, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's somebody, there's an up and comer out there who, who could do that. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think they have anybody within the franchise yet that yeah. you could just pass the torch to. He's not set it up that way yet. Um, but, uh, I mean, obviously it's possible, but you'd have to bring somebody else in rather than have promote from within, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mike, what about you? you? Want more? As you know, they said, you guys have said he wants to do this till he's 80. And as long as he can run, as long as he can jump, they're going to keep on doing these movies with him in it. And it's 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 a bank it makes money because you know what we said 80 million that's just the american that's just in the u.s it's doing very well also internationally and that's also a big plus the u.s is a lot of times not their main targets and everything so it'll be very interesting to see where they go with it and what they end up doing with it and i think he can keep on going and he might actually if he gets old enough maybe they will have a secondary character come up and do it you have to remember in the tv show um mr phelps wasn't the original lead in it mm -hmm. so they changed it and so i definitely think why not let's keep on going with it it'll be fun 
Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I'm as long as they keep making them, uh, I don't see the quality diminishing as that much. So I, I'm in. Um, you know, I, I I always hope for more. You know, but uh, I'm not disappointed when I come out because I think that they are still fun. Uh, as Mike likes to say, popcorn movies at the theater. Exactly. Uh, you know, so um, to be honest with you, they still all like. I'm sure. By the time that the second one comes out, I'll have forgotten everything that happened in this one, and I'll have to be reminded, as, 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 you know, how how it's different than any of the others. Um, but uh, I I am on board with them. I think uh, as at one point when they first started, I was opposed because I just thought that they were not really in the same spirit as the TV series. But I've seen I've since uh, uh, come to just uh, enjoy what what Tom brings to them. And it is Tom. I mean, you don't hear about Paramount wanting more screens or Paramount wanting premium screens. You hear about Tom wanting more screens. You, like this is like Tom is an inv- as invested in this movie as he is in his, you know, his other uh, things in his life. I mean, yeah. he's just, he's Let in complete control of it. Too, if you don't mind me hopping in for just two seconds, I want Absolutely. to kudos to Tom Cruise for going to all these different movie theaters to greet the audiences. Mm-hmm that he did for the first day it opened because it opened on the Wednesday. He did five different cities up and down the East coast Mm. and going to the theaters to watch it with these people and stuff, including Atlanta here. And it was just, it's pretty amazing and stuff. So, you know, kudos to him for that kind of commitment. And I know I'm pretty sure, you know, I did at my theater, they had that little opening bit with him. You know, and uh, the director, the director. Yeah, kind of yeah thing, I saw that too. Which was which was awesome. You know, because it is a big deal for people going to the movies again and everything. And you know, so I thought it was pretty awesome. Well, he is the guy that you know people have credited as single handedly saving the theater business uh, with uh, Top Gun Maverick last year. So uh, I think he is seeing himself as Mr. Cinema, despite the fact that it's Nicole Kidman, his ex, that comes in and, and begun in the beginning of every AMC uh, movie. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> it's more like Tom Cruise who who feels that uh, he's the savior of cinema. Um, and you know what? it's not a bad guy to have on your side. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it looks like this one, um, as, uh, has crossed, uh, uh, checked all the boxes that it needs to. Um, I guess we all give it a thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, very much so. All right. So, um, so on that note, uh, we will take a quick break and then we will come back and close out the show. Okay. YouTube folks, thank you for hanging out and, if you guys have made it this far into the video, thank you so, so much. We do appreciate you guys. You know, we've been blabbing for a bit and everything like that. And for a bit, you hinted on something at the last like five minutes of the main topic there, Mikey. And you were talking about, you know, who would you want to see as a lead in a Mission Impossible film and such? Is there any actors or actresses? that could take over for Tom Cruise. Cause I could see, you know, mission impossible is, you know, that's the one thing I used to love about the TV show, you know, at the beginning of it, you know, the, for each mission, they used to give the, the photos and they used to put out different people who would be on the missions with them. And even though like four, three or four of them were always the same. Well, exactly. You always had Martin, <laughs> you always had Martin Landau. You always had Leonard Nimoy, or you had Barbara Bain. But you know, but it would it was always cool that you could do stuff like that. And I always thought, who if they did that with the movie, who would you want to see? You know, in these type of movies, because I think there's a whole roster out there that would be pretty cool to see. Can I can I just uh um say first and foremost that i outside of who to get to replace like the main actors or the team or whatever um uh even though that uh you know ving reigns has been there since the beginning uh these movies are pretty uh lack a lot of diversity um they take place in pretty exotic places which is always nice but as far as the the main people involved um you know, it's 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 pretty much like uh, 
like not very diverse, pretty, pretty white overall. Um, yeah, there are a lot of women in this, but, um, you know, does it pass the Bechdel test? I don't think so. Like, like there's, there's a lot of like, I think you could open up this franchise a little bit more and, and maybe that could make a big difference in terms of future box offices. I, I do think that, uh, if this really is an international force, it needs to be reflected of, of that mm. way instead mm-hmm. of just being like, I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know it runs the risk of being accused of being like, you know, a woke thing, but I think in, in, you know, certainly we've seen that in, in a lot of cases that is not box office poison. Instead, it's exactly the opposite. No, exactly. I agree completely with that. But I think it would be really interesting to see. Let's open it worldwide, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, wouldn't it be kind of cool to see someone like Michelle Yao, you know, leading the team? It would be pretty darn awesome. I think if they were going to go with someone who would be younger. <laughs> I'm not saying that Michelle Yao wouldn't be welcome on the team. But if you're you're going to hang your hat on somebody in particular as the next Ethan Hunt, so to speak, they they should be, yeah, they should be significantly younger. Okay. Okay. So you're talking how young, you know, in their twenties? <laughs> well, thirties. I don't know if I'm talking about like Ethan Hunt Jr., but no. <laughs> but I think, you know, there's definitely possibilities for it. I definitely think, you know, I was thinking, you know, you could get somebody like a Brie Larson a part of the team, or you can get someone, you know, something like that. And you know, there's so much cool stuff you want to talk about going like full out woke that's that would do it (laughs) and there's nothing wrong with that at all (laughs) and woke is not a bad thing you know no no i i you know how i feel about that sort of thing i don't i mean i don't care but um but it's like i i do feel like uh it would be po- it should be possible to come up with uh somebody uh that is capable of bringing in the box office and uh, i mean if you're looking at like um uh oh what is it uh, the kid that was in um tenet come on help me out here uh uh mm-hmm. is it glover's kid right oh yeah i know um, I mean, I, I like him a lot and I think he's shown that he can, he can, uh, handle a movie, uh, that kind of, especially an action movie. Um, uh, what the heck is his name? Um, David, uh, John David oh, watches John David watch. Oh yeah. He was That's... wonderful in Tenet. I think he would, he has that very charismatic, yeah, he's mysterious I'm sorry. vibe. He's Denzel's kid. So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, poof, I mean, that's, Ooh, you know? I, I yeah that would that that I would I would seriously consider uh, turning it over to him. Mm-hmm. No, that's a good one. I definitely think Donald Glover would be great too. You know, I think yeah, it's another one of those times when you're like kind of uh, you know shake your head because uh, Bozeman would have been amazing as well. You know, oh well, I kind yeah. of if we're talking about a continuation versus a reboot, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm actually not entirely convinced that's not part of why um of the Dega character of greg mm. Tarzan davis's character mm. because while he's not super well known yet um i could well obviously now him and tom have that relationship after two movies now um yeah. i could see it and you get you get sort of at least some sort of diversity representation you're bringing you know you're bringing that forward um and he was intriguing to me um so yeah. i i uh, I'd lobby for it. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Uh, I think Greg... even though it's such a small part, he has kind of that cinematic presence that we all remembered him despite like all the overtop actions. He didn't, I would hopefully he'll get to have some really intensive, exciting, more action heavy sequences in the next movie. So we can kind of see him in, in that role too. Would be cool. That could work. Definitely. I agree with that. And I think, you know, there's so many good characters in this movie and in this universe. I definitely think they could, you know, continue it with no problem. And, you know, it would be interesting, too, because 
thinking about it with the different characters and the different actors they've had in all the different movies. And I think they could continue to pull some from older ones too, which would be kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I I know she characters dead and everything, but man, uh, Rebecca Ferguson is is so amazing. I mean, I would love to Mm. see her get a shot at doing, I mean, I know she's doing silo right now, which I'm very curious to see that series. I've heard good things about it. Um, it's done by the, the guy who, uh, was behind justified and everything and uh i'm really looking forward to seeing that but she's she's pretty amazing and she really does hold her own in this movie as being an equal to ethan yeah oh very much so it's yeah. like i i kind of felt like she died only because she had to well for me it was character wise too because you know i i was like wait a minute i don't remember her having an eye patch you know it's like wait a minute <laughs> it's like so I thought, no, it was it was really well done. And the characterizations in these films are a lot of, you know, a lot of great ways to go. And you know what? Let's see what happens and everything. But, you know, I definitely could see, you know, as long as it's not Ryan Reynolds, I'll be okay. As the lead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know. that would that would that would maybe uh, skew the series even more towards humor. Yeah, change the tone for sure. <laughs> oh, very much so. So I think, you know, I, there's some cool stuff there, though, folks. And I think, you know, there would be inter- the, the technology story is right on, like you said earlier, Mike, AI is the big bad right now for a lot of different things. And so it's easy to do. In but, real life. Oh, in real life. But, you know, there's... I was reading articles even to earlier today before I went to see the movie that, you know, so many jobs are going to disappear because of AI. And it's just, it's crazy. And, you know, even what I do for a living outside of podcasting is possibly wait, you know, wait, eventually you podcast for a living. What? I wish you know. you're, you're breaking the spell. No, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm breaking the illusion of all those millions of dollars we're making from Earth Station One and ESO Network. <laughs> okay, talk about, I couldn't talk keep about, uh, say that. Talk about a Mission Impossible, making money during, <laughs> <laughs> doing, doing, doing podcasting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's it's going to be it's interesting to that you have you know these different, you know, ways of AI taking over. And so just the idea of it taking over your, a lot of your personal information and government secrets, there is no privacy in so many different ways anymore and everything. And it's just, it's scary. It really, really is. And that's why, you know, you just got to be smart about stuff, folks, as we like to say. So, you know. And you know what? Until the AIs come knocking on and, you know, there'll be fake mics, fake <laughs> Gordons out there, you know, as long as it starts saying howdy, you know, you could probably have it, you know, take over for the show and we have Monday nights off again. So, <laughs> so it's like, okay. And then I'll just have to edit. They'll still make me edit it though. Cause you know, that's what AIs will do. No, <laughs> that's we, the pens, we take over the show, you edit. Oh God, sorry. <laughs> you know. So it it'll be interesting to see. But yes, it's cool stuff and it was a fun movie. And you know, Tom Cruise moves so much better than than me, and he's 60. So, you know, it's pretty amazing. So it's pretty cool. So, you know what, folks? Definitely. Tell us what you thought. We definitely would love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us for the little bit of extra, as we always like to do on the show. All right, let's close up the podcast. So that's going to wrap up another episode of the Earth Station One podcast. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We do appreciate you guys for being with us. And as we always like to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we got lots of great stuff coming still. And, you know, now that um, the writers and the actors are on strike, 
you can look at these actors because you know <laughs> we're just as funny and as humorous as <laughs> the rest of them out there and we're not going on any strike anytime <laughs> soon so it's cool you might see some restrictions on people we can interview on the show mm -hmm. but that's going to be a that's a whole different story mm -hmm. but you know what we'll get to we'll cross that bridge when we get there let's thank our regulars though for being here Jenny, you made it through your first episode with us. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was great. Oh, you were a ton of fun. Anything you want to promote or shout out about? No, you know, not too much going on right now. Just um, hopefully I get to see some people at Dragon Con this year. You know, we're getting close. So I'll be there yeah. like most of you guys. And um, other than that, we're taking a nice break. Oh, that's true. It's time to get ready for this type of stuff. And it's right around the corner less than 50 days folks less than 50 days and i think what next week we're recording a brand new dragon con report so it would be tons of fun to be able to do that mr mike do you want to reveal what the secret topic is going to be this month the secret ingredient you mean yes that's right <laughs> well we are going to be talking all about food uh at dragon con uh where to get the best food and uh, it should be a lot of fun. We are still in the process of uh, getting our our guest crew together, but um, yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of news happening. Uh, some good, some not so good, some confusing. So uh, we'll do what we can to go over that uh, as best we can as uh, with the information that we have. Uh, about a week from uh, well, as you're listening to this, in about a few days, actually, it's going to be uh, next week where we actually record it. So. That's awesome. That is awesome. Can't wait to do it. And look for the invitations everywhere, wherever social media is found, probably right around the same time this goes live. So it should be a ton of fun. And Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much as always. Oh, thank you. It's always a blast. I love chatting movies with the crew. Anything you want to shout out about? I just kind of want to give a shout out. I've been having so much fun seeing the um, fun cross promotion of Barbie and Oppenheimer on social media. And I think I was kind of worried when these movies were coming. I was like, oh, no, there's going to be like this weird competition. Like you should go see Oppenheimer. It's historical. It's a true story. Or you should go see Barbie. It's going to be more fun. But I love that people are just like celebrating these two very different types of movies and encouraging people to go see both. So I just think that's really fun and a good time to celebrate movies in your local theater when theaters are kind of struggling this summer. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I I love it too. I think it's great. The best thing about it is that it's a grassroots grassroots movement. It's not. It's two different studios that, as you put yes. it, are competing. So it's not like it's in their best interests. And yet, I mean, I actually I think uh, behind the scenes, some of them have been kind of mean to one another. But the people out there are just embracing the whole idea, the silly, ridiculous idea behind yeah. these two movies coming out at the same time with uh, two great talents. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see. I think it's going to get both of them are going to get a bump out of it. Um, I think so, too. I will say, though, that uh, I mean, I plan to do the uh, Barbenheimer thing this weekend, but I'm not doing it the same day. The people who are doing it the same day really have my uh, my respect like because that's more a, power that's a, to you. That's a, that's a full day at the theater and that's going to be a weird experience. Your dreams that night are going to be very freaky, right. uh, yeah. but uh, I, I love it, too. I think it's great. Great for everybody. Mm -hmm. No, it'll be very interesting to see for next weekend. And oh boy, we've got to see both of those. So it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, I don't know which one to go see first, the upper or the downer. So it'll be great. And Mr. Mike Gordon, we've made it through another one, my friend. We did. And as always, it's my pleasure. Anything you want to shout out about, sir? I do. I actually watched a uh, a new movie on Netflix uh, this past weekend. Uh, it's an animated movie called Nimona, and uh, it is a very cool movie. I definitely suggest people check it out if they have not done so already. I mean, it's kind of popular on Netflix. It's in their top 10 or whatever, so probably a lot of people have seen this and already, but... Uh, um, I think it's really well done. The animation style is is really uh, top notch. Um, the 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 setting of it it's a fantastic it, well it's a fantasy and it takes place in this fantastic setting it's kind of a mix between Blade Runner and medieval times like it's just this beautiful synergy of something I hadn't seen before 
the the characters are fun it's a fun adventure uh but it's got some relevance to it it's got some uh things in there that i I think are are relevant to today um kind of reminds me of the same kind of energy that that uh, that pixar brings to the table a lot as far as content as far as message and as far as animation even though the style is is very different than a pixar movie um uh so uh, it's based on a graphic novel um and uh i think it's just an amazing piece of work so i definitely recommend people check it out um it's nimona it's on netflix uh see it awesome actually i've got a new show that judy and i've been watching actually it's on peacock and we are started watching a tv show called mrs davis which has been amazing it has been a ton a ton of fun It is very quirky, very weird in some places, and it is a nun's journey to find the Holy Grail. But she's sent by a AI that is pretty much controlling the world. And but everyone's it's not like a a big force that's, you know, like everyone's evil like oh the ai is evil and everything this ai is like you know like a big alexa or something like that that everyone has part of their ears and is you know helping everyone along and everything and for some reason the holy grail has become the quest and this uh nun who didn't have the nicest most uh innocent past is you know being asked to help her out the ai out it's pretty fun it is great. It's brought to you by Damon Laidlaw, Le- the folks who, and some of the folks who brought Lost, and some of the other shows. It's it's been a lot of fun. It's a great, great. Fun, it's a quirky show, and it's it's fun. I definitely would recommend it. You know, you watch the first episode and you go, huh, and it gets just gets better and better from there. And it uh, star- stars uh, Betty Glippin from Glow you know and so and she was great in that and she plays the lead she's the nun which if you can believe it or not so it's pretty cool so it's tons of fun definitely check it out definitely highly recommend and as always we we like to say on the show thanks everybody for listening we couldn't have done this without you guys and you know what we have such a great time talking to you guys always remember you know if you want to support the podcast please check out our t public store and get some really cool ESO Network swag. Also remember, if you want to listen to our show before the rest of the world, why not join the ESO Network Patreon? For as little as a dollar a month, you can help support us here on Earth Station One. Check us out at the ESO Network Patreon at patreon.com slash ESO Network. We do want to hear from you, so please write us anytime at feedback at earthstation1.com. Remember, you could also find Earth Station One wherever fine podcasts are found. And of course, now Earth Station One is in video format up on YouTube. Please subscribe and tell all your friends. Like and subscribe, like and subscribe, and ring the bell. What the hell? You'll know when we have new episodes out twice a week. So definitely check us out, folks. On behalf of myself, of course, Mr. Mike Faber. Thank you, Mr. Mike Gordon. Thanks, Ms. Ashley Pauls. And Jenny Green, you made it. Thank you so much. We do appreciate you. We will see you here next time on Earth Station One. Stay safe, hug your loved ones, and this we will self-destruct in the next 30 seconds. So take it easy, folks. All right, should we start counting down? No, just kidding. Peace, and we are done. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek.